Kia ora rā, te whānau nau mai hoki mai, a te planting seeds tēnei kaupapa. I hope everyone's having a good holiday festive season. Um, no doubt that each of you are um, enjoying that summer weather and time with your whānau. Uh, anyway, we're here in this episode and really, really looking forward to the kōrero that's about to unfold with um, a brother, a friend, um, also a local hero <laughs> and someone who has many feats and many talents. So, brother Brad, no mai. Kia ora, brother. Kia ora. Thanks for having me on here. Man, yeah. <laughs> glad to be here, bro. Glad to be here and have a kōrero. Um, yeah, seems like you've got a mean story, bro. Um, growing up locally here in Whakatane, uh, Wairaka, gone through many different things, a couple of bands, jiu-jitsu, been in martial arts, and, you know, you just still keep that same ahua. And so when you think about all of those things, do you think about it too much, bro? Or is it just like, ah, oh, this is just who I am and this is what I like to do? Yeah, I think the cool thing about growing up in um, Whakatane, you kind of... No one really cares um, too much about, um, like, you know, the music side or the success of that, which is kind of keeps you kind of grounded. So that's why I think Stu and I haven't really left Whakatane area. But, um, yeah, it, it, it gets – it's pretty – it's a different lifestyle. Like, uh, yeah, it's hard to explain. But, um, yeah, you're – probably find out through the kōrero. <laughs> is it a feeling, you reckon? Yeah, definitely. And and, you, and it's definitely you'll need a perseverance because there's more lows than highs in the music industry. And I would say in martial arts too if you're competing as well. So yeah, you build a lot of resilience and um, yeah, you, it, you learn to have a really tight circle around you too, mm. which you'll, yeah, I'll probably kind of talk about this kind Man. of stuff. So that probably goes hand in hand with humility, eh? Because as you said, like, friends that have known you forever, they don't really, like, see you for the glitz and the glamour or all of the things that you're doing. And so it's a way just to keep you sort of, like, toe rather than getting caught in all of the highs that do come or what it seems like anyway, eh? Yeah, it's, um like, especially for the music industry, it's really easy to get lost in it. Um, there's a lot of temptations, like drugs and stuff, and... Um, you can get pretty crazy and um, we've been kind of lucky because we've been quite cool-headed and level-headed and try to kind of stay out of the way of all that, um, the temptations. I do enjoy a beer here and there and stuff and we do get jolly and stuff but um, I think coming from Whakatane, it's 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 really cool. And I, The other thing about living here is that um, it's, it's away from the rat race mm. and the people here are really humble and quite level-headed as well so you can kind of have a normal conversation as opposed to the music industry where it feels like you're either trying to someone's trying to take something from you or um Mm. you kind of have to like climb over someone else it's a doggy dog industry like is that because it's um there's a lot of people who are trying to be in that space as well is that, or do people see, oh man, these guys have something, I want to get a piece of that? Is it a lot of that going on? Or? Yeah, it's, it's um, a, the music industry, you kind of have to, there's a, it's almost like a formula that you have to know, and then <clears throat> it's like a semi-blueprint, and then the hard part about music is that I would say if you had a thousand musicians or a thousand bands, maybe two bands will make it. Mm-hmm. So that's, um, so you've got to, I think, um, in regards to music, you've got to have a really strong understanding of formula, mm-hmm. um, supply and demand. It's, it's, it's a business model, basically. Like it, it's 99% business and it's definitely music, but you could have some really good hip hop artist or something, good drum and bass artist, but if they don't know how to, promote themselves or market themselves have the right team around them um yes it'll just go pear shape uh just so it's just going to be talent that doesn't really get the shine it deserves eh no there's so much talent in new zealand but um unfortunately i sometimes new zealand and uh, pretty much around the world they think that being famous is success Mm. which kind of is i guess in the music and arts 
but um, it's you still have to make an income and stuff, mm. and that's the hard part trying to find out how I'm, how I'm going to make a living off this after all that hard work because there's, there's there's next to no rewards in music like next to none. Wow, yeah. but it looks like father curling it, eh? Yeah, 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 and yeah. If I right now, I could say um, I could pretty much make an artist kind of financially stable because after like twenty years working in the industry at a pretty good level, mm. kind of know the pros and cons, and you really got to know <clears throat> the cons of the industry. Mm. So. Um, yeah, I think if, if I'm on subject, but yeah, yeah it's just um, the music industry is really hard. Like, mm. I, yeah, I'm glad my kids are kind of wanting to do something else <laughs> outside of music because you spend almost 99% of your career either trying to survive for the next, you know, to pay rent and power mm. and stuff, and then you need to. Yeah, it's so fickle. It's so fickle. You've got a, a um, then you might have a record company who'll take eighty percent of your pay, and then you've got your agent, your booking agent, your lawyer, your accountant. So you might get maybe five percent far out out of a hundred dollars if you if you just let the industry take control. So um, we take control almost of ninety percent. Of everything now, wow! So we manage it, everything almost mm-hmm. um, to a point, but um, yeah, I've I've made sure like in our current band, sorry, Ooh, in our current band, um, Lab, we've I've surrounded myself with a solid team. Mm. So everyone in the band is either an accountant or got masters in business and stuff. Wow! Yeah, and then we do have accountants and stuff, and uh, their job is to kind of second guess. So. Everyone plays a role in in the band LAB, so um, yeah. Wow, oh, that's, that's mean. Yeah, and you've gone from doing the current band now, which is just pumping. You know, LAB going hard over these last couple of summers, and just really um, solidified a space within the scene. Um, really, really dominant and really creating that vibe and that energy. And if we were to go back a few years back, you know, you done it with Cora. And so when you say you've had 20 years in the industry, it's like very well much at a high level. And so when you think about, um, I guess, where you are now, what were some of the things that you learned being in Cora or even before that? I would say Cora was, <clears throat> we're in a band Cora between 2003 and I left, I think, 2014. And we taught the world seven years. And the thing I learned about being in Cora was that um, I just thought playing music and what I thought felt good to me, that's what mattered in regards to running a band or business. Mm. The brand and that old formula of supply and demand is really important. So you have a, a, a product, but then there needs to be a demand for that product. So... I'm not saying Cora didn't quite have the product, but we had quite a tight niche. So we were kind of, it was like a certain sound that kind of was quite arty or different, but different. And um, from a business point of view, it 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 needed more. It needed something like um, content, like video content. And then... Um, Another important thing in regards to like, I think the model for music is exactly the same for any type of business. Business, you know, mm. yeah, you need good timing. The timing has to be bang on. Um, networking, networking is an absolute. And then you've got to have a team, a solid team around you. And I don't think we quite had it in Cora. I think we just had four brothers, a manager. But it needed something more to take you to that next level. Mm. <clears throat> I think there was a hole in, in the circle. Personally, that's what I thought. And we needed more content. And so we did have our differences. The band kind of fell apart a bit. And then I left for two years 
And then played for Kim.com drums. Gee. Yeah, and that was uh, an experience. <laughs> um, paid very well. I mean, you're playing for a billionaire. But um, that was a good experience. And then we started LAB. And I'm kind of, I, I kind of use a lot of what in LAB things that we did in Cora that I do not do in LAB. Right. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with LAB, I think the success is because it's 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 it is a quite an old soul sound, mm, and it's not. Mean. I wouldn't say yeah. It's just a very vibe sound, and in today's music, a lot of people like the uns uns, mm. or you know, they go the rhythm and vines, and we're kind of not that sound. But <clears throat> what I noticed, just push the, that one back a bit, bro. Like push the whole. Oh right. Okay, good job. Got it. Um, what I noticed with the music industry been in it for so long is that everyone's playing electronic music or the modern rap music and it it's all kind of the same it's it's, Mm. it has a certain formula and i knew there was a hole in the market there was a niche there and it was quite a big hole and i saw it sitting there and then joel our singer i was left the band I was a little bit down because music was everything to me and then um, I was writing a song and then looked in, uh, on the Good Morning Show and then mm. I heard this blues voice on the TV and I was like man who's this on the Good Morning Show mm. and I looked in there at this white king and boy and he had a broken hand and he was singing a blues tune and I couldn't believe it I thought it was a black man so I was like, this kid's unbelievable. And he's still a kid. He just came out of jazz school. Mm. So I messaged him. Real, I didn't realize we were friends on Facebook. Um, sent him this demo. And he sent back the vocal melody with his voice over it two days later, like straight away. And I was like, messaged him. And I, I knew straight away, I was like, this kid <laughs> is just, he's just different. Uh, he's just different. Like... The other thing, like, with the music industry, there's a lot of amazing singers out there in New Zealand. <clears throat> but you got to, when it comes to music, and I would say in any business form, what makes you kind of different from everyone else? And one thing <clears throat> with Joel, his timbre and his vocals is, it's very thick, it's very warm, and it's very old soul. Mm. It's almost like, I feel like he was a black man in the past or something, mm. you know? Like, he had, he's just got this different vibe about him. And I was like, no one's got that timbre. Everyone, mm. There's a lot of amazing singers out there that can troll all day, they can do mm. But no one could kind of, like, make me feel a certain mm. way. And I was like... That draws you in, eh? That yeah, kind he's of, got yeah. this certain soul. And when you meet Joel, if you ever meet him, he's a very old soul. Mm. Very old when he was a kid, his dad and mum drove around on a motorbike with him around America, and they went through Tennessee and they were going through blues oh. shows. And they he played for the Doobie Brothers oh. as a little kid, and Muddy Waters, all these blues. So he's a blues boy, and he's still a kid. He was only like thirteen, I think. So, and all he needed was someone that, with our experience, to kind of like guide him, mm. and so. He came over home. I didn't even know he could play the guitar. And he was singing away. I said, man, this kid. And then his hand got better. And, I, and he said, oh, do you want me to play the guitar? And then he played it. I was, <laughs> tongue started rolling out. I was like, what the heck? And then I was like, man, kid, you're going to make me some money now. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew like, this kid's got it. The mm. own, he didn't miss little things like... Um, with Fran and Laura, my older brother, my brother that's just under me, they both went to Toy Fakari. They did five years there. And then I learned through them how you perform as a performing artist. Yeah. And so I learned those skills in Cora. And um, they're amazing. Like Lord, and at the moment, <clears throat> my older brother's working for the symphony orchestra. Wow. Yeah, and they're doing like techno music and stuff. And friend does modern Māori quartet and um, he's doing all, I think he's doing theatre as well and film so I took all those skill sets off them while I was in Cora and then I was able to kind of show Joel you know like little things like um, his shoulders would roll forward when he would sing which is a sign that you're only going to play to a small crowd wow. so you had to learn how to open shoulders, stay off your toes uh, stay off your heels 
um, how to turn the head, like little things. But I didn't want him to act it too. Yeah. I wanted it to come from the heart. It's 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 more than just music. It's it's you've got to have the whole package. And like um, in regards to music, if you really want to make it, if the front man, if you can't put the crowd into your palm of your hands and you watch a live show. You might last maybe you know, a few months or something. Mm. It's a um, yeah. So that's well, I knew we had the content and we had the product. Wow. Uh, I knew straight then. I was like, "Far, this is it." So knowing that, you know, we had Joel and then Ara with his experience. He was the um, accountant and manager for Catch a Fire and bass player for wow. twenty years. So there was his experience, and then Stewie. You know, he's just road savvy touring for like pretty much most of his life, my younger brother. And then me, Huddle, who we met, he came to one of our shows, and he's another kid. He came into our studio. We had a party, we played, and I said, man, come to the studio, we're going to carry on writing two in the morning. And he jumped on the piano, and I was like, is that that kid from the pub? I said, yeah, we'll record him. Yeah, and the yeah, rest is history with him in the band. <laughs> so we had the product, we had the content. So the next thing you've got to try and, there needs to be a demand for it. So for a good business, and I might be wrong, but for the LAB, we needed a good team. And so I went to a guy, Mikey Tucker, who I've worked with 20 years ago. And he worked with Trinity Roots, Black Seeds, and all those guys. And he did some work with uh, Earth, Wind & Fire Fire over in America. He was actually over there. He was like an uh, agent over there. And so he, I wouldn't say he wasn't liked in the industry. He was just a, a, a really aggressive businessman. Like he was real hungry. He could, mm. But one thing about him, he knew how to get over the finish line with deals. And I, I needed that. I needed someone that could like talk the talk, but he would always get that deal. Uh. And, and I, everyone knew Mikey Tucker was that guy. I mm. mean, he, he can... Like an LAB show now, he can get Jim Beam <clears throat> and they'll endorse us like 150000 now. To, oh. Just to cover like all our toilets and tools for the shows and stuff. Wow. So he's one of those guys. He can get massive sponsorships. So I needed a, someone like that. Mm. And then he's like an agent, booking agent. He does logistics. He's all in one because in the music industry, you need a booking agent that usually takes 10% off the top. Then you need a manager that might take 15 to 20%. So, you know, there's 30% mm -hmm. gone. And then they'll charge their live fee, which might be 8%. So you've already lost, you know, 40% or something, oh, 50%. Right. And then you've got to pay your band, everything else. So we might get 20% off the bottom. So I wanted a LAB to have something that was like, hang on, we'll do the work. We'll control that part of it. And I only need a guy that can do the whole shabam mm. for a smaller. Smaller. And we found the guy. <laughs> and, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and he's really good at um, getting radio and play. Yeah. So, we had the product, and we knew how to get the demand for that product. Mm. And then, yeah, I kind of knew it's like, and he knew too. He he was like, yeah, this is gonna work. <laughs> oh, the confidence was there, eh? Yep. Uh, yeah. from experience but also knowing the formula of what it looked like to you to actually get you guys to another level eh? or yeah. to get you guys out there yeah. and what sort of was there a moment or was there a particular single that where you were like nah this is going to be the song that we're going to release out yeah so there was um we have a song called in the air and mm. that that's still number one after three years it's still the highest played and just last week well end of mid-december um, we've got five songs that are in the top top ten. Well, that's one, two, three, four, five, and then I think we've got ten songs in the top twenty oh. singles. Yeah, so um, and and that and that's cool. I, I, I think that that's cool, but I, you still have to. I think after all of the success of numbers and charts and that, it, it, is it paying your bills? Uh, uh, is your family getting fed you know do you have you know a house over your head and you're paying your mortgage or whatever it is mm. and so 
getting older now, I've realised that you have to like that is almost important. Well, it is more important mm. than than just charts and stuff. You still got to like other numbers adding up. Wow, you know? and so that's mean. Yeah, and when you um think about, I guess all of those things. Um, is all parts of this fun for you too, bro? Like, are you enjoying every part of understanding things at this level and, I guess, creating? Like, is, is all of it fun for you or are there parts of it where you just got to do? Yeah, it, it's it's easier now. Like, mm-hmm. it's um, when I was young, it's like we had to do a show and then you get paid and it was almost like surviving. Um, it's like a nine-to-five job that... You don't get to sleep because in music you just barely sleep. You're just always touring. But now it's got to the point where it's like you have a really strong team. They do all the mahi and the artists just sit back and just watch the show unfold. You know, it's, it's got to that point. I wouldn't say that hard out, but it's pretty close to it. But yeah, it's that's pretty awesome. Cool. And you've yeah. got an awesome summer in the works. Eh? You've got what four shows throughout the summer? Yeah, yeah. We do Tauranga um, 30th of December. And that, I think that one sold out. And then Napier, Whangarei, and then Electric Avenue in Christchurch. And then um, we fly off to America. We do American tour, come back for a month. Oh no, Hawaii after that, then come back for a month, and then we're off to Europe and tour through there and yeah <sighs> holy moly bro that's epic to just i guess hear the progressions and what you guys are doing not only here in aotearoa but you know what you guys are going to do globally and just creating that vibe and that that fun and that sense of i guess um excitement for those people who get to listen to your guys music but it's cool to actually hear what happens in the scenes you know in the backgrounds rather than just seeing you guys on stage hearing these men the amazing music but like what you guys actually talking about in the backgrounds and i remember just at the gym doing jiu-jitsu the other day you were saying rehearsal was just playing the same chords over and over and over and over again you know yeah yeah a lot of people when it comes to band practice but i'm like oh i don't think you want to man it's pretty boring you know you have to sometimes we'll play a verse for a whole day so it's you know it's it's the one and then could a little subtle shift in the sound make a big difference to that whole verse Totally, and even the placement of songs, like how you order Organized. your songs, because um, we're not really like a hip hop act or a, um, electronic act. It's a, it's more of a journey. Like we're a more organic band, mm-hmm. and um, I wouldn't say we're like a dying breed of music, but it is harder these days to find an actual group mm-hmm. um, doing concerts these days. Most guys will just push play on the DJ. And then, um, you know, just play along to that. And that's just the nature of the beast, you know. So mm-hmm. we try and still maintain that old school musical thing. But, um, yeah, with music, it's it's so hard, man. You could literally do maybe a verse too long and you can kind of lose the crowd like that. Oh, so, true. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a real skill set. And um, our dad taught us how to play journey gigs because we used to play at the RSA with the commercial <laughs> hotel in Whakatani so you'd have the black powers raging out to us when we were kids and then one song could ruin it and then someone's throwing their glasses at the back of the wall <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. it really does come down to I guess the energy and the vibe that you're creating for the crowd eh? and yep. do you, can you feel it when you're up there and you're like oh man they're not, no one's feeling this no one's dancing as much or no one's singing the song or is that what you're feeling as a performer yeah, absolutely. It's um, sometimes, but then there's there's beauty in that as well because um, sometimes I'll go to a concert and watch a certain act and it feels like the concert's going like this and what happens, our, our ear starts to burn out and you're like, man, it doesn't matter how much harder they go, it's just, it's too much. Uh. So sometimes it's strategic to like do a set like this and then you pull right down. And then it builds tension again. It's like watching a movie, you know, you get a movies and if it goes up too much like this, you kind of burn out. I mm. think Marvel I comic movies that. is a quite mm. a classic thing of just like action, action, <laughs> action, 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 action. Whereas back in the 80s and 70s, it was 
like the Godfather was just tension, 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 mm -hmm. and then boom, and then tension again. And yeah, that's, that's we're cool. We're more that style. We like to build that tension, like the oh yeah, I felt that, and then oh they took it away from me. Yeah, but you kind of want that in music. Wow. So mm. that's the journey you're taking people on, eh? Wow. That's the hard part of live performing. So we're we're live performers. So um, like last yesterday we did a um, six hour rehearsal. And it, even though we've played the songs a thousand times, it's still, you've got to, if, 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 if the band doesn't have a chemistry or the artist doesn't have a chemistry with each other, the crowd's going to smell it from a country mile. They'll know straight away these guys are just going through this. it. Yeah. yeah, that's why pop artists, they kind of look like robots. And after a while, you know, it's the, the, the gimmick kind of fades. So Far it's out. hard, man. It's wow. a skill, man. And then apart outside of that school, you've, you know, got a gym, jiu-jitsu. I just signed up a few weeks ago. <laughs> absolutely loving it, my brother. Yeah. And that seems to be your space where you can just, like, decompress where you can. One thing that you said to me is, like, you can't have peace without war. And for you, that just gives you your war, that space of, like, battle. And it allows you just to let go of whatever it is because, you know, you've got a lot of spinning plates elsewhere. But coming into the gym and coaching people and actually rolling is that seems like it's a space that grounds you. So, you know, how long you been doing martial arts for, bro, jiu-jitsu, and what does it do for you? Yeah, um, my family were part of uh, Rangatau Aotearoa, which is uh, Māori martial arts with the marshals, Benji Marshals yeah, uncles. Yeah, yeah. And so my uncles started with them back in the 70s and 80s. And then my older brother, Lorden, started competing in Muay Thai and all my cousins as well. And then um, through the 80s and 90s. And then I was going for my black belt with um, ROA, Rangatoa. And um, my brother did jiu-jitsu for like three months. He came back to Whakatane. And we were sparring. I said, oh, that crap doesn't work, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I think he checked me out like two, three times in <laughs> a couple of minutes. So I kind of like, man, that's it. I'm done. So I took the gloves off and been doing jiu-jitsu nearly 20 years now we started down Wairaka um, down Whakatain and I think you joined us yeah I, I think did. you were still at school yeah I was bro. back in the day <laughs> wrecked yeah. me though I didn't go back <laughs> yeah. fine so when you're thinking about like that aspect because I've been doing it now for three weeks there's like a there's a bug that's attached to it, bro. You know, and like for me, I'm just getting a lot of hidings, but a lot of learnings and it's a mean environment and just how you can manipulate the body and how you can move your body and put it here and then it creates a reaction on their body. It's like, it's like that, what they say, it's a human game of chess and I've been really enjoying like that part of it. And like for you, when you think about like your journey within JITS, do you still feel like you're still learning, bro? Man, yeah, I've been a black belt, I think, six years now, and I still feel like a white belt. Like, um, I've never known an art or any sport that's as close to chess like jiu-jitsu. Like, you could, I could put you in an arm bar and nearly break your arm, and you've probably got eight different ways of getting out and choking me out, crazy as it sounds. Or I could be choking you out, and you could get out and completely break my leg. Like, it's... And that's what I love, because... My brothers and I all grew up on 80s arcade gaming. We're all mm -hmm. gamers, so we're all strategic kind of warfare kind of kids through gaming and martial arts. And what I love about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is that it builds lots of humility because you're pretty much always losing. You always get <laughs> choked out, arms get broken and stuff. And you're, yeah, yeah, it really... And I think with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you can really read someone's in a character just by sparring them wow. everyone yeah that's one thing I've learned like everyone rolls um different and it usually the way they think in that or their their demeanor comes through their Brazilian Jiu Jitsu it's crazy like, oh, yeah. I actually feel that now bro yeah as you sort of like say that yeah you'll get some that are more cruisy so they're and they'll they, they don't like confrontation, so I, I'm a bit of a chill dog. I don't like, in general, I don't like seeing bad confrontations. I'll kind of like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so I kind of try and go around the corner to try and choke you out, yeah. as opposed to some people will go head on. They'll, they'll try and just break you straight away. So 
in life they're usually like that. They're usually like, you know, mm. just boof, boof, boof. And then, um, yeah, or you've got guys that have got um, anxiety and they move rigid. So, yeah, and it's that's one thing I love about it. You can really understand another human being through Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And the other thing is like the camaraderie because you're always losing and getting beaten. You get so much humility because you're so used to lo- um, losing. I mm. do find like not picking on rugby players and that, but when they come to the gym, they have a quite a macho kind of like, you know, tough. And then you get some little white little university looking Peter Parker, Spider-Man, like choking them out. <laughs> they, they kind of quite can't understand it. Mm. And I, I th- that's what I loved about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that, you know, like the guy I learned off, this guy, Michael Horrigan, I think he was 56 kgs or something. He used to just wipe the floor with me and just and I was like 108 kgs and he just yeah just this tiny little guy so I like that's I, 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 and in the camaraderie it just it builds a brotherhood you know mm. this yeah it's really cool I, I really enjoy that part of it too you know the humility the always losing but then being able to like shake that other person's hand and actually have a corridor and then oh bro like you know getting the tips and things of that nature and for me just starting out it's been like can really feel everything that you're already saying and I can sense now that I'm just reflecting on how I've been rolling like how my character's coming out too and those sort of things and actually figuring out how other people are so yeah. really enjoy and it's the skill set I was talking to Brad Rapira as well around um me potentially coming into jits and he sort of said to me one thing that comes with it is just your awareness like say if you were to ever be in a altercation mm. you're not focused on the person you're focused on everything else that could be happening around you and with that skill set there's just a bit more not necessarily confidence but there's more calm rather than sort of like being quick to react or anything like that yeah i'm even though I did a lot of ROA kickboxing, and I was like, man, but you'd see a confrontation in town and still have that kind of hyperventilating kind of, <laughs> but I found with jiu-jitsu, you just go so calm because it's just so confrontational. And then you literally, there's nothing in your being that wants to fight because you're just like, it's not worth it. <laughs> the, um, yeah, and I feel like you have a clearer, more clarity of making not making bad decisions like my personal thing is let's say someone gets heated with me in the streets straight away I think man I have to pay court fees <laughs> in the paper I don't want to wait inside a cell like you can think that because you've done so much jiu-jitsu whereas I think if we don't have jiu-jitsu and you're not always losing getting completely smashed on the mats you get fear kicks in so you go into this kind of fight oh, fight thing you know what wow. I mean and jiu jitsu takes all that away it just makes you like oh, it's not even worth it man. wow that makes so much sense and that's yeah. sort of something we're speaking about as well is that that translates into even other areas of your life eh? yeah. it's not just within an altercation it's if you're at mahi or business just yeah. as the bro was saying that he was in a bit of a heated moment at his workspace and instead of him popping off he was like he rolled that morning so he felt like he didn't necessarily gave into their altercation yeah. which is like quite choice and i think about even just my journey within business and even being a papa and things of that nature ever since i've come into the gym which is only a short while i can see the pattern and how it's so parallel to those other areas of my life oh, awesome man. yeah because you like even when i we we had our first role i think about two weeks ago as soon as we made contact and we started sparring i was like oh this guy's a chess player <laughs> real methodical I was like oh he's going to be a nightmare in, in, a, couple, in a year or so because um, yeah people that are very analytical uh, they they don't even like um, I mean you're built well but I've got some guys that just have no meat on them all, and they're mm-hmm. real analytical and I'm just like oh he's going to beat the crap out of me yeah, <laughs> yeah it's crazy like everyone's I thought it's hard to read like when we made contact, I was like, mm, is he going to come in really aggressive? And I said, like, no, he's coming in like a chess player. Oh, nightmare in a year. <laughs> and I still get to the other black belts. I said, oh, that kid's going to be a pain in the butt scene. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite interesting how you can, and I, I would assume you're quite like that in life. So mm-hmm. it's quite interesting that you can, um, with jiu-jitsu, you can 
definitely pick up people's characters through it. It's weird, eh? Mm. It's a fighting art, but you can kind of understand someone through through this martial art. Mm. And one thing that I've picked up on you too is like you're really you're a really good teacher. And like, what does that come from for you, bro? Like, do you just love coaching? Do you love just explaining or getting people better? Like, where does your coaching style come from? My dad. My dad was a um, brilliant. Uh, my dad was a really one school set he taught my brothers and I was um, he was an analytical him he was, he was a master as a, as a coach analytically I used to watch him coach rugby teams and they would do so well it was crazy but it wasn't so much like what he had done to the team it was he knew he was really good at um, reading every single person and he focused on their strong points but if they had weak points it was the way he used to do his horse whispering to kind of work on their weak points. So I have this young kid, um, his name's Klaja Tapo, Alamuti Tapo, he's oh, a yeah. young boy. And um, he's, he's quite disruptive, really good athlete, really disruptive at times, but um, unbelievable athlete. But um, he was real hard to deal with in competitions. So he told me that he was venom. He would hit this in the venom and say, so he'd be like, Uncle, you need to talk to venom. And I, <laughs> you, have, you know, you have to, as a coach, you, you've got to like find their weaknesses, I think, just as much as their strengths mm. and bring out the best of them. And that to me is why I, I like coaching. It's, yeah, it's, it's, I like bringing out the best of people. Mm. Well, that's with, even with LAB. I got to mentor all the boys in the band and I love that whole trying to like you know build them up. Yeah, I reckon that's a bigger uh, reward than dealing with myself to try and be successful. I like that to me is the high. Like that's the ultimate high. If I could, if I had to leave music, I'll, I'll do it just to teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Because at the moment my journey is to uplift through Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I don't know what it is, but I'm so addicted. You're pulled in, eh? I'm pulled in, like, yeah. I don't even, like, I know a lot of black belts must get upset at me because I think they charge, like, a $50 an hour, and I'm like, man, I don't even want the money. I just want to just, you know, I love, I love, yeah, I just, not. A, it's more like I just want to make these guys, I like the underdogs too. Mm. I, I get a massive kick out of watching underdog athletes that aren't that good in the gym, and then I'm like... Right, let's take <laughs> let's you get to you. Gym. Yeah, I yeah. love that stuff. Do you feel your other parts of your life help you to just be that way in climb, bro? In terms of knowing that all the other areas, such as your poop tail, all of those areas are covered, so you can just give a lot to um, jits. Yeah, I, um, um, I think my brothers and I have always kind of had that because uh-huh. we were raised down Wairaka, so big family, no money. Um, so, and it was like a bartering system growing up, you know, like, oh, bro, I've got no lunch. So, you know, the cousin will give you lunch and then you pay back. And so I think that whole giving more than getting was kind of instilled into us as kids, not realizing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's a bit different for my kids. I feel like they kind of get everything they ever wanted. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I'm kind of like, ah, oh, but you know, you want them to feel that kind of, kind of struggle. <laughs> but it's a, and I, I think that's just general today. I think none of the all the parents are super awesome now. Yeah. Whereas back in our day, man, the parents are too busy playing touch. <laughs> you know, it is different, eh? Like the times have sort of shifted. Totally. There was a generation, as you said, where there was just um, so much struggle and once you get to an age and you have your own kids, you don't want them to go through that kind of struggle, eh? So you sort of like start babying them, giving oh, them everything man. that they want, but then they get to an age and like, Oh, you spoil little bugger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's like that. And um, that's why my, my 11-year-old boy, I, he gets up at 6 a.m., goes down to the gym Monday to Friday nearly, and trains jiu-jitsu till school time, and then does it after school. I'm trying to instill work ethic still, mm-hmm. but um, doing it more nicely as yeah. opposed to you know, the way we were taught it. We were taught quite brutal. And you talk a lot about, um, you know, Growing up and, 
you know, being in a big whānau and with your brothers and papa and you're taking in all of these things without you really realising. But when you think about, you know, your upbringing, what sticks out most to you? Um, it was a different childhood. My dad and mum, we, I, we lived down Cutler Crescent, which is kind of, you know, a bit of a hard upbringing down there. Um, it was kind of pretty much all black pals down there, so we kind of stuck out like thorns down there. We were pretty mm-hmm. kind of like straight little Māori boys down there. And I, my dad wanted to get us out of the ghetto a little bit and kind of steer us away. So kind of from the age of seven and eight, we were working till, you know, one in the morning, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, we're doing gigs. So we had to play shows all from little, little kids. And so we'd play RSA, I think, Fridays, and then a Portiki Hotel on Thursday, Saturday, and RSA on a Wednesday. Get home at 1 a.m. And we're still at primary. Get up at 6, try and do your homework, have your breakfast, go to school. Got back at 3 p.m. and then we had to rehearse 3 till 6 p.m. Then load up the van, drive to the next gig, set it up, do a four-hour show, get home 1 in the morning. And then we did that from 7 to like 20 Oh, 14 years. So we never really had a childhood, you know. But um, we all did surfing. We were all wax heads, my brothers and I. So we did lots of surfing and skating. And, yeah, that was our lives. So that's all. And, well, we had no choice. It was that or you just didn't eat. Mm. Mm. So wow. that's where all our music and that thing I said about the journey of music, my dad was a master of it. He knew how to, oh, the song's not working, so he knew how to. And I think that just got instilled in us. And so that musical skill set, which would be the content, was burnt into us from the age of seven. And a lot of people don't know this, but that was our childhood, like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. No parties, barely. It was just work, no camps, nothing. You Damn. just had to work. And was this just filled with him wanting to like create a better life for you guys? Or did he just see something in what you guys were doing? Or Um... I'll be honest, he was a hard man. He just, he was just, um, yeah, just hard. He just, he just, he he was, I wouldn't say he was selfish, but he kind of was in ways, you know. Mm. He, 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 we never really got any money for camp or anything, but yeah, he'd buy us, you know, drumsticks and stuff, mm. anything to bring money into the house. It was kind of like the Jacksons. Wow. Yeah, it was quite abusive too, so that was our upbringing, you know, and then... Yeah, if, if if we weren't practicing or if we made a mistake, man, you had to pay for it big time, like physically. So, yeah, so it was really different upbringing. And then, yeah, that went on, yeah, 20, 21 years old, maybe a bit Damn. older. And you were surfing, skating in yeah. your free time, eh? That was your guy's little, like, yeah. whakatai, just let it all go and just go out and have a bit of fun. Yeah, pretty much most of our lives we were always skating and out, of, out in the ocean. It was the only kind of freedom away from that because mm. I kind of hated, didn't hate, I loved music, but I hated the life thing with Dad. It was, it was hard. It was like, I mean, imagine being eight years old and you're getting home at one in the morning. <laughs> you know, it's like an eight-year-old kid doing a four-hour show. Oops. Damn. Yeah. And when you think about, I guess, um, when I think about you and you went, you're you not just a drummer, eh? Did you fellas pick up all of the instruments? Yeah, I studied piano as well. So I, I was doing private lessons, doing piano, I think that at the age of five. And that, that and then, um, yeah, we all played piano and guitar and bass and drums. And my dad would make us sing a cappella by the piano. Oh. Yeah, so we had to do like four part harmonies and stuff as little kids. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Damn, I could sort of see they just the joy that you had for music, but I guess the way that it was coming out, there was mm. a bit of, I guess, resentment in, embedded oh. within all of that, eh? Yeah, I, I was like, oh, I'm never going to do this when I grow up. <laughs> like, I hated every second of it. I hated playing um, Mustang Sally. 11 p.m. on a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm out I don't, don't want to play this song yeah. again. Uh, <laughs> I want to play my own stuff. But when you got to the point of actually creating your own music, did yeah. that give you guys more passion? Or 
Yeah, it was hard, like, to transition from being playing covers music to doing original music. It's they're almost two completely different arts. It's um, it was so hard to transition to be an original songwriter. But what we did have was work work ethic, hard hard work ethic. So even with LAB, when we go into studio. We'll start at nine in the morning, and sometimes some of us will finish four a.m. and then we're up at six, have a quick feed, and we're back into it at eight. Like that's just been ingrained in us. We get three, four hours sleep. That's just normal day with LAB. Oh, and we just write, 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 and we'll write hundreds of songs, and a lot of them don't go on the album. It's just not not good enough. It needs to be better, 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 and you could spend. Tens of thousands on the studio, yeah, and because I produce, I, yeah, it's, um, they do, some people know me as a slave driver, I guess I got that with dad, but I can kind of crack the whip in the studio, like, yeah. sometimes Joel, because he's a, when he's tired, man, he's tired, so he usually starts. His productivity and creativity just goes out. Eh? Yeah. And uh, I'm just like, don't care, it's 1am, and he's, he's just like. But he's used to it. He just understands that's just the way I work. Mm-hmm. It's just like, if it's not good enough, it's not good enough. I could sometimes make them do a guitar part. I could be there for four hours, and I'm just like, not good enough. Again, again, again. It could be hundreds of And days. are you just waiting for a particular sound? It's a feel. A feel. Yeah, it's got to be an emotion. It's got mm-hmm. It's got to be magic, and I'm always trying to hunt for magic. Even if it's a good hook, the hook's got to... It's got to come from somewhere. It's got to come from. It's got to have an essence about it, and that could take. Sometimes, it could take two weeks just to get the right. The chorus is there, the melody's there, but the temperament's wrong, the the attitude toward, the the timing, the oh. um, yeah. It just it's got to be right, and I it's if it's because I'm very very particular when it comes to my music, original music. I could spend months on one verse months and is that just your standard or that's, that's just, just the standard yeah. and that's what you got to have you've kind of have to have someone that pushes the button i reckon i guess that's my job in lab i'm really very particular the keyboards have to be a certain way if they're not the right sound i'll make the boys fly back down the wellington do it again but in the first year they couldn't no one could really work with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then after, I guess, album four, it's it, they'll, they all have that work ethic. They, yeah. they understand. It. I don't have to say that anymore. So Joel could do a guitar solo, and I won't say anything, and he goes, no, not good enough. And he's trying to get a better... Get it in. But that's good. You wow. know, like, and before he used to complain, like, what do you mean it's not good enough for? I think it's good enough. That's oh, that's that crap's all gone now. It's just like nah, it's not. It's got to be better. It's got to feel yeah. It's crazy. <sighs> yeah, yeah. I yeah. can sort of like feel it though, bro. Yeah, I can yeah, yeah. feel like just the craft and just the art that comes with, um, I guess, creating something that's um, going to be at a standard, but also create the feel and the emotion that you want the crowd to experience as well. Because something that I've just only recently. Um, thought about is when you look at music because I'm not really I haven't necessarily always been a music person I'm not someone who has a playlist or things like that I can just listen and just enjoy it but don't really have the ear for either the lyrics or different things that are playing but something that I was thinking about um, just would have been just as recent as last week is in songwriting it reminds me of that it's like only a small chunk of words but it tells a whole story oh, yeah. and that's the art in it eh? and then yeah. I was talking to the bro Stan that's one part but then you're thinking about the melodies and everything that's trying to fit the story and the lyrics because if it goes with a different tune it changes the whole story of it and so, so is that what you're thinking about throughout? exactly and then you can have the song you can have this product and then as an artist, this is what a lot of young artists struggle with is they don't look from the outside in. They're so emotionally attached to the song that if an opinion 
And it could be usually from an old head that says, hey, they get very offended and all. Oh, I've been asked to help produce other artists, but I have done that and kind of say, hey, maybe we move it this way a little bit. They get very offended. And I'm, man, I'm an old head, so I'm just like, nah, I'm not going to work with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. I shouldn't. But um, you, 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 it's it's a craft. And yeah, you, you, if. If you don't look outside of your own product, whether it's music or business, and it's like, if I can say, you can polish shit all day, and this is a scene in music, and it's still going to sound like shit. <laughs> yeah. And you that's a lot of, shit all day. Yeah, you can polish it all day with all the glitz and glamours and chuck synthesizers and 10,000 harmonies, a full orchestra, and it's still it's shit. The song's got to be good. And um, one thing of told a lot of up and coming artists I said if I can play your song on the guitar and I can still sing it it's a good song because <laughs> it's only your voice and the guitar but if I can't play the song and not I guess more for band but if I, if I can't remember your words and can't play on the guitar it's probably not going to hold me you know in regards to a brand or product and I kind of strongly do believe that today I think if you can you know, that's why I think Māori songs for Māori people last for so long because <laughs> yeah. their melodies are so memorable and the guitar chords are um, so relative to our ears. There's another thing. If you play a song and it's got more than three chords, it's too much for the human ear. So they get real ho ha with the song and they'll flip the song. Wow. That's why pop music only used two chords or three chords. Wow. Yeah. So there's a science to it too. Yeah, so. but then you've got to know how to get that chemistry out of there. It's less is more in music. That's that's the secret. Wow. Yeah. Wow, right, bro. It's been next mm. level. Got a you're a busy man, bro. Just mm. wanna say thanks for um just creating a bit of time. Um I know we've been trying to do this for the last couple of weeks, but I'm glad we were able to do it today. Um you've got a busy, amazing summer ahead of you, bro. I know you've had even some good time with your fan as you cherish that because Man, the amount of flights that you've been doing over these last couple of weeks, bro, it's crazy. And you're still in the gym doing your classes. And just want to do a big mahi to you, bro, for coming in here, sharing the back scenes, but also a bit of your story. Um, and no doubt uh, the summer's going to be busy, but it's also going to be fun. Um, and just want to give it over to you, bro, if you um, have any final words that you want to share with our whānau. Oh, bro, there you hey, Thanks, everyone, and thanks for listening in. I've probably babbled on too long, but, um, yeah, I hope there's some stuff that they could take away, the fun they could take away. And for artists and musicians, you know, there's some little gold nuggets in there, and I think, yeah, they might take something from it. Man. Kia ora, thank you for having me on there, my bro. Man, my bro, appreciate that. You're in my space. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm going to be back on the mat and you'll be tipping me out very soon. <laughs> Too much, my bro. So thanks, Seeps, brother. Oh, thank you, Marty. Man. Kia ora, whanau. Che, che. Man, barass. Oh.